Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining. We're going to let some people file in this morning and get into these different feeds real quick. Thank you again for joining today. If you have any questions throughout the session today, feel free to throw those questions into the chat and we will hopefully get to those. We're trying to give, you know, 45 minutes for, you know, a quick conversation between me and Rob, and then we're going to give 15 minutes for a bunch of questions from the audience. Hopefully you have read Flex Index's most recent report and have some great questions based on that report. Or you've read an article, one of the 19 articles I've seen online that related to the report and have- Should have I put a link in the chat, by the way, so people can find the report if they haven't seen it yet? Yeah, that'd be How fantastic. Do do that? Yeah, so if you if you uh, ping it directly to me in the private chat and I'll put it into the chat. All right, awesome, we'll do that now. All right, well, I'm gonna lower the music down and we're gonna jump right in. You would appreciate this, Rob. Restream, the platform we're using to do these talks, has AI music or is AI generated like ambient music, which uh, which is of course very kind of like elevator music y, I feel like. <laughs> yeah, it's very AI elevator music, which I don't know if I'm, I mean, I'm sure there's artists who actually are creating elevator music for a living. So you know, hopefully we're not helping those folks out of a job, but we'll talk more about jobs and job creation in the next few minutes. Um, thank you to everyone joining us this morning. My name is Omar, I am managing community here at Collective. And I'm very excited to you know, bring you all together today. And I'm also the head of insights and engagement for a company called InSpace. And I'm very thankful today to be joined by Rob Sadow, who is the co-founder of Scoop for Work. And he's also one of the founders of Flex Index, uh, which is kind of like the, re if you can correct me if I'm wrong here, Rob, the research kind of arm of Scoop. And you know, very interested to again, dive into your latest Flex Index report for this quarter and hear a lot from you. So That's thank my you pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I guess I would describe it as Scoop is kind of both a software and a data company. Increasingly, we build software to enable uh, hybrid and distributed teams to better coordinate around where they work and how they work. And then we also have uh, a pretty large and robust data set on how companies approach flexible work globally. And as you mentioned, we do a lot of reporting and research on that to help folks better understand where we're at, where we're headed, what trends are interesting to watch, that kind of stuff. That's awesome. And yeah, Rob, I guess give us a little bit of background here. Like how I think a lot of people are aware of Flex Index or aware of Scoop, but how did, you know, specifically Flex Index, like how did you all get here and what, what was the journey to get here? Because I think people, when they hear about startups, they're like, oh, it must have happened in a year or something. But the, the background, I think, is very interesting for your company specifically. Yeah. So, so I wish, Omar, that I had some amazing, you know, story. Like we had this epiphany and it kind of just exploded from there. But in reality, it comes from a fairly embarrassing kind of like place for us from a software perspective. We, as I mentioned, we build software to enable hybrid and distributed teams. And we ran into what is probably a question we should have thought through on the front end, which was how are we going to figure out which companies are hybrid? and in what capacity and realized that not only was that becoming very difficult for us, we would reach out to someone about our software and they'd say, no, we're fully remote or actually we have these specific days. So it doesn't make sense for us. Um, and we're like, okay, well, somebody has got to have this data. Like, where do you go? Where do you go find this stuff? And we realized that no one had the data and it was pretty interesting to a lot of people because if you're a job seeker now, I think neck and neck with compensation, flexibility is one of the most important considerations around mm -hmm. you know, what job you want to take and uh, job seekers couldn't figure out how companies were approaching or specific companies policy on flexible work. Companies were regularly trying to figure out what their peers or competitors were doing, and there was no good place to benchmark that information. On top of that, media was writing lots of articles. I remember it was you know, February or so of 2023, so beginning of the year, and Disney changed their policy. There's always questions in the media around, okay, well, is this the beginning of everybody changing their policy or is this anecdotal or one-off? Then we started to realize that maybe there would be a lot of value in starting to collect this information. And that way, different folks would have a data set to go to and be able to understand, is this one-off or is this part of a trend? How is this moving month to month? And that was the initial genesis of the thought process around creating the Flex Index. That's awesome. And I guess, how long is the timeline from Flex Index getting started to where we are today, where you're putting out quarterly reports? You know, the most recent one you partnered with BCG, which we'll dive into a little bit in a second, but like, what's the timeline there? So we originally came up with the idea for it in September, October, 2022. We spent the last few months of 2022 trying as best as we can to figure out how to get the initial data set of policies from anything from a company's careers page, if they were clear on it, to if mm -hmm. it was written in a job site, to asking anybody in our network who worked at different companies and executives, like what their policy was. You would not believe how much time we spent trying to create a survey that was short enough that we could get people to fill it out and in four or five questions actually be able to understand or roughly typecast how a company was approaching flexible work. 
Uh, so we spent a bunch of time around end of 2022 and beginning of 2023 doing that. We launched it publicly in February 2023. We've written a report every month since then. We do a weekly newsletter that has, I think, more than 4,000 subscribers now, mostly CHROs, real estate executives, investors that are tracking this type of stuff. So it's picked up pretty rapidly through 2023. And it's been about, I guess, 12, 13 months in total of effort to this point. That's awesome. Yeah, I think people underestimate just how long it takes to build things like this and how much like groundwork effort it takes. So I want to make sure that we kind of emphasize like the time frame it takes to build some things. Nothing like, is overnight. Nothing no. ever happens. It's always there's some unsexy part of it that takes a lot of rolling up your sleeves. That is the case for every, I think, every meaningful product, data set, whatever it might be. Yeah, it's the 10 year overnight success, as people like to call it. Totally. So how many companies are actually in the Flex Index now? I know it started at around like 4,000. I think you had crawled and you know found the information for, but what is it uh, at now? And how are you kind of thinking about growing it and continuing to grow that information base? Yeah, totally. So we launched it in February. I think it was just under 4,000 companies. It's doubled mm -hmm. since then. So it's about 7,500 companies now. Those 7,500 companies have approximately 55,000 US offices and then more offices abroad. Um, they employ more than 100 million people. We focus wow. specifically on their corporate office requirements. So what does that mean for people at headquarters and more desk-based jobs? But we are evolving that and starting to capture more detail around specific employee populations, locations, job functions. That's one of the areas we're going to invest a lot going into 2024. Um, we add companies through uh, two primary mechanisms that we actually put out a methodology report for the first time in October. It's pretty cool. That has like a detail on specifically how we do it. One is anything that we can find from a reputable secondary source, mm -hmm. primary source. So that could be, as I mentioned, a careers page or a company site. If Forbes writes an article, you know, and Jenna quotes an executive there mm -hmm. on a particular company's policy, we'll find that and use it to update our database. If a company is really clear on, on their jobs page, on a job hiring site, for example, we'll find that stuff. So a bunch of it comes from secondary kind of like sources or kind of like direct references in that way. And then about 30% of it comes from primary. So direct from executives or managers or others at the company who at the beginning of Flex Index could fill out a survey, as I mentioned, that was pretty short. We only posted stuff where we could validate the person worked at the company with email address, reach out, clarify, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then in October, we launched Flex Profiles, which now is a way of going to the site and logging in and authenticating as a user of the company and being able to update directly. And so we have companies now updating there. The vast majority of those folks are actually directors and VPs of HR, recruiters, CEOs, like that's really been the group that's been most engaged in kind of making direct updates on the site. Interesting. That's super fascinating. Yeah, I think there is a little bit of a question of as we dive into the data here a little bit, like the, you know, what, what millennials might call Instagram versus reality, you know, what people say their flexible policy is versus what is actually being enacted on the ground level. And understanding that nuance, I think is really important for employees, because if you're applying for a job, and you're seeing online that, you know, like company has flexible policy, it's three days a week, but the reality on the ground is it's a lot more flexible or it's a lot more stringent. I think that can be, that can have a big effect on your outcomes as an employee or like your staying ability at that company. Totally. And I think even going into 2023, there's a crazy stat. I can't remember, maybe it was Mercer, I think, who had done some research on this, but it was a, it was a big firm. And it was like 50% of companies at the beginning of 2023 still had unwritten policies effectively on mm -hmm. how they approach flexible work. So it was like kind of like rough expectation or kind of like tribally passed manager to manager on what the expectation was around this. And look, I think even the most common model, you know, and we can talk about the different bucketing and how we do this, but within what we describe as structured hybrid, which means mm -hmm. companies that set a specific expectation on some time spent in office, not full time, but some time. The most common model there is minimum days a week, as you described, so two days, three days a week. But then the team has the ability to customize that and say, mm -hmm. okay, well, let's then kind of adjust this a little bit based on our particular workflow and needs. And sometimes that's with specific days of the week for that team. Sometimes it's flexibility for the team. And so there it will continue to be, I think, some, some customization and slight differences between what the company says is policy and what a person may live or breathe on a day-to-day -day basis. Some of the mm -hmm. work we're doing into 2024 is to start to try to capture more of that, but in really big companies, it's impossible to get it perfectly right for what every team is doing. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think you touched on something really important there too. I, I love that you all have the buckets and you're very transparent about what the buckets are um, because I think that develops a lot of clarity. And I think there's a lot of discussion in the future of workspace right now about, hey, hybrid, the word might go away long-term, it might become just flexible work or how we define that will change. Um, but I do think there's a lot of nuance there. Like when you mentioned big companies, uh, what are you seeing in the companies who have you know, multinational offices? Because what, what I've been seeing on the ground when discussing this with workplace leaders is that you know, their APAC region might have a different policy and three different policies across their APAC region than their EMEA offices, than their North American offices might have. So I think, you know, there's nuance there as well. What, what are you seeing on that front? Yeah, such a good question. Um, there's a lot going on there. I'll kind of talk big picture and then I'll talk how I think it, how it varies right now. And I'll talk a little bit about how I think it might evolve, you know, over the coming years. So right now I would broadly describe that there are two main camps, so to speak, in flexibility. Smaller employers, so let's think about that as companies with maybe 500 employees or less, tend to lean more into full flexibility, meaning that they do not require specific days or a specific amount of time in office. They leave that flexibility up to the employee. Mm -hmm. There's a portion of that's fully remote, but a substantially larger portion of it is not fully remote in the sense of no offices. It's employee's choice, meaning the company has offices, but employees can choose whether to go in or not. Hmm. That's very different to your point from what's happening on the other side for, for really big companies. The majority of really big companies are structured hybrid, and they set a specific expectation on how much time is spent in the office. On average, it's about two and a half days. So think about it as you spend half your time in the office and half your time working remotely. That's been most common for at least U.S. headquartered employers in terms of what we've found. It's actually mm -hmm. been incredibly consistent year to date. It was 2.5 in January. It's 2.5 now. One of the mm -hmm. big reasons why we don't see really meaningful return to office from a, if you look at the castle data around occupancy relative to pre-pandemic and it's 50% in January and 50% now, it's because policy has been pretty flat and it's about half the time that it used to be. So that's what's most common for big companies that are structured hybrid. To your okay. point on some of the variation in what's happening, very different rates across different countries. Mm -hmm. I think Nick Bloom and Stanford have some really good data of this, that English speaking countries tend to offer a little bit more in terms of work from home rates right now. And there's a number of reasons we can get into why that might be the case. I think that Europe is a little bit kind of like in the middle. I think Asia is a little bit further behind in terms of the amount of time it's allowed work from home. There will certainly be cultural differences, just the way we see in the US. The West mm -hmm. and Northeast of the US, for example, tend to offer more flexibility. The Midwest and South tend to do a little bit less. What I think might change in the future and be really interesting to watch is U.S. headquartered multinationals have offices all over the place and people mm. move around between offices and collaborate between offices. And so I would be surprised if some of the flexibility in some locations doesn't permeate offices in other locations for those companies. That will then influence the competitive dynamic for talent in that local market. Other companies will then feel like they have to make adjustments. And so I expect we will see even the more lagging countries or locations from a flexibility perspective, adopt more and more of it over time with some of that influence. Interesting. Yeah. And I think that there's a bit of a misnomer there as well. And I would love to know what you're seeing in the data from your side. The companies we speak with, on a, especially on an enterprise level and the companies we're working with the past few years, even though they might have a very structured hybrid policy as an enterprise level company, they still have a large batch of employees that are basically exempted to be remote. And it's, you know, not, it's not 5%, it's not 10%, it's only 25% of the company is exceptional, it has been made an exception to continue to be remote the majority of the time. That doesn't mean they don't come together, that doesn't mean they don't come to offsites or onsites or et cetera, but they are majority remote. And it, it's interesting because I think that is not necessarily represented uh, all the time in the papers or you know, in, in the online, in the news. Uh, I mean, it's like very much like this or that, but I think there's a lot of nuance there. What are you seeing in the data from that perspective? Are you, do you all dive down that far into the nuance of the organization? Yeah, you know, we certainly see, to your point, a bunch of companies that say you can apply for remote or fully remote by exception. Happens a mm -hmm. lot. I think this is super complicated. And there's been some companies that have really gotten themselves wrapped up trying to figure it out because <laughs> a bunch of companies hired fully remotely during the pandemic and have now struggled with the... Well, we would like people in the office. Am I going to force people to move away from their location, even though I told them that they could be fully remote? You know, Amazon has had a that kind of like a big thing with this, where in the early in 2023, they told fully remote employees that they're going to have to move to different offices. Now they're saying that actually it could take years before some of those fully remote people have to move because you're uprooting people's lives. 
Different companies have said that we would like for no one to be fully remote. But then again, if someone has really specialized expertise and we can't find them anywhere else, then sure, they can be fully remote because we need that person really badly. And so it's complicated. And that's part of why I think the the more successful organizations are doing a better job allowing this to get customized at the team level and not saying, look, if we're a 10,000 or 50,000 or 100,000 person organization, we can say that Tuesdays and Thursdays is the right answer in the office for our entire population. Rather, mm -hmm. we can say, hey, look, we would like you to get together some during the week, uh, but recognize that may be different in different teams and what that looks like. Let's allow some customization there and not uh, be overly structured in a way that prevents us from hiring and retaining and engaging top talent, especially folks that maybe we hired with a different promise around uh, what their expectation around office time and flexibility was going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the expectation setting and I'm like, I think people, you know, in general want a sense of stability. And I think that's one of those things that I think companies that are offering flexibility are allowing for. At the same time, of course, you know, like these are business decisions that are getting made. And I think in the end, like, employees, I think I personally think that employees will self sort over time. And I think we're going to start to choose companies based on some of the information like what you have in the flex index. So I do want to dive into that. I don't want to like, you know, we could talk about this a subject for I think for hours, Rob, wherever um, you want to go. Do with me. <laughs> I do want to make sure we cover a lot of what you know, you had in the most recent report, specifically, you know, this idea that, and you know, like with the data is saying where you have companies who are offering a greater level of flexibility, are driving greater growth in revenue. And I'm gonna make sure I said that correctly because there's a lot of nuance in those words. Is that accurate? <laughs> yeah, it is roughly accurate. I'll give a little bit more color just because I think yes. it's, the detail matters on this stuff, right? So maybe take a step back. Debbie Lovich at BCG, who is fantastic and runs a lot of their stuff globally on this topic. And I've been talking a long time about this debate on productivity. And productivity debate has been everywhere when it comes to hybrid and remote work. And you can find studies from different countries and different populations that argue that it's more productive or less productive. And you know, in some ways, and I, I kind of said this also on our State of Flex you know, webinar yesterday, I think productivity has been a bit of a Rorschach test you know, for people where you <laughs> see what you want to see. If you want it to be less productive, you can find the data that supports that. If you want it to be more productive, you can find that too. And so we're trying to figure out how do you get to the bottom of this? And the thesis was, if there is some meaningful difference in the productivity of employees when they are full-time in office versus fully remote or somewhere in between, mm -hmm. shouldn't that show up in the financials in some fashion? Shouldn't you be able to see that in either revenue growth or something else over time? And so we decided to collaborate on it between you know, Flex Index and BCG and said, okay, can we look at public companies where we've got some revenue history and see if there's a relationship between revenue growth between 2020 and 2022. So basically the last three completed fiscal years and their flexibility approach. Hmm. So we had, I think more than 550 public companies that were US headquartered in the Flex Index where we had revenue data from 2020, 2021, 2022 that BCG could find. BCG did a bunch of analysis on pulling not only revenue, but also for each of those industries that the companies was in, what that average revenue for the industry was over that time oh, wow. period. The reason we did that was to normalize it because there was a risk that maybe there's more tech companies in the fully flexible bucket and a different industry in the other bucket. We didn't want industry to taint kind of the analysis mm -hmm. that we did. So we took each company's revenue. We normalized it against what its industry revenue was over that time. And then we looked at the bucketing and said, okay, well, what's the difference? And the really interesting things that came out of it were twofold. One was companies that offered full flexibility. So again, meaning that employees are not required to spend a, some minimum or specific time in the office on a weekly basis, outperformed their less flexible counterparts by 16 points in revenue growth between 2020 and 2022. So that was pretty meaningful. Hmm. The second was, and then we can dive into each piece of it, but the second was, even if you look at the less flexible group, the group that was structured hybrid, so required some amount of time in office, but not full-time, grew at twice the rate of the group that was full-time in office over that time hmm. period. And so consistent that most flexible was doing the best from a revenue perspective, and then the structured hybrid, and then the full-time in office, and that felt pretty important. And so we put that in our report, um, and that's, I think, would have been a lot of noise around that and discussion around that, I think, over the last few days. Interesting. And do you think that, I guess to dive into that a little bit, do you think that on the revenue side, is there any indication there and how are you looking at that, like revenue versus like profitability or versus actual, you know, like when you're thinking about revenue, how are you defining revenue there? Yeah, great question. So 
revenue we just took as literally like reported revenue in public statements for that year for that company. So top line revenue, uh, Got it. revenue growth over that time period. Revenue is not the perfect measure for this. It's a starting point, right? In, in reality, we want to go from revenue to earnings to shareholder mm -hmm. return, right? There's a bunch of different things to look at. And it's not like we had the opportunity to look at everything and we picked revenue because that's what felt like it was a good story. <laughs> we did revenues as far as we got so far. Yeah. The first kind of like step in that direction. So we're like, okay, what happens in top line performance? Or, you know, because in theory, if employees are more productive, does that mean they're producing more that's leading to more revenue in practice? Mm -hmm. Where I'd love to go with it is getting toward uh, profitability and earnings, right? And that, but that starts to also add in some other things that are interesting. If companies that are flexible manage to save on real estate costs, you know, versus mm -hmm. others, then that will start to show up in things like profitability. So you get away from pure productivity at the employee level and you start to bring in other factors that are associated with remote work or flexible work. And so to me, this is step one in a journey and exploring the financials here. But I thought it was a pretty important first step. It was the first, re first piece of research that's been done or published to date that had any financial tie to flexibility. And I think that stuff's really important because the conversation that I think is happening in executive meetings, kind of like leadership team meetings and boardrooms everywhere is mm -hmm. between CHRO and CFO and CEO and board around what do we do on flexibility? And if, mm -hmm. if the CFO says, hey, look, there's some data out there that not only are public companies that are flexible, not underperforming, but actually might be overperforming on revenue relative to companies that offer less flexibility. And they're having an easier time recruiting and retaining and engaging talent, which we found in a report we did in July. And maybe they're saving some money on real estate because not everybody's in the office every day. That's pretty powerful, you know, from a top line and a bottom line perspective. And we want to enable those conversations to be able to happen and have the right data to be able to discuss that the right way. Mm -hmm. No, that makes sense. And I guess on that side, how are you thinking about developing this over time? Because I think, you know, it is important to, and one, I appreciate that you all are building this in, you know, in public in some ways, right? And you are like, you know, liking these conversations, diving into the nuance, whereas I think castle systems in some ways, it's oh, 50%, but they don't go online and say, oh, it's 50% of 60 to 70% pre-pandemic numbers. So it's actually more like 20 to 30, you know, they don't necessarily represent the nuance on their reports, et cetera. And I think you are doing that. How are you thinking about, you know, continuing to build this in public and going, driving that line from, okay, now we're at revenue. Now we understand how it's driving earnings, how it's driving actual investor return. How are you thinking about yeah. representing that or driving that? I think it's super important, you know, and, and I think every company and look, I'm a big admirer of Castle's work. I think it is, you know, in my mind, it is one of the three data sets that I triangulate against most closely, right? Like I take mm -hmm. our data on policy. I take Castle's data on how is that translated to actual occupancy? And I use Nick's data on WFH research and what employees and employers are saying about flexible work. And none of those data sets are perfect, but when they all agree, generally that's pretty interesting, you know, and it gives mm -hmm. us a sense for where we're at and where we're going. I think we invest really heavily to make sure that the data that we provide and the research we provide is something that we you believe people and executives can rely on. And so a big part of that is publishing our methodology, which came out of a good discussion with, with Nick, who you know, works on a lot of our reports with us and was like, Hey, I think it's probably the right time to do this relative to the scale of data that we've got so that people understand how we do it. Mm -hmm. And then talking through methodology and being really clear on every chart and sample sizes and sources and who we collaborate with. And ultimately we've built this to a place where organizations around the world are using it as an input in the way they think about policy. Um, and if they're going to do that, then we have a responsibility to be really forthcoming around the way we approach our analysis, where that data comes from, the things that we're doing to improve that over time uh, and building in public, to your point, is a really good way to do it. So we'll keep kind of like approaching in that regard and kind of get better and better at it. And that'll allow us to get more granular data to provide deeper insights to help companies better think through this and what we're still the very early innings of a journey toward what I believe is going to end up being more and more flexibility you know, broadly across companies. Interesting. Yeah. And do you have, I guess, a question for you on that. Do you have any, as companies move towards flexibility, you touched on this a little bit on the side of the, or the real estate side. If you see companies like, you know, reducing footprints and let's say a company can work with, you know, 50% of the, just arbitrarily 50% of the real estate portfolio they used to have, are you seeing them take that 
And are you having conversations about this? Are you seeing them take that funding they were spending on real estate and spending a portion of it on employee experience as well? Because yeah, I think there's a, there is a, a misunderstanding, I think, sometimes that when you're increased flexibility, you don't need to spend as much on employee experience or workplace experience. But from the companies I've spoken with, it seems like there's actually a, a need to increase spending on things like on-sites and off-sites and you know, those spe specific moments that bring people together and build connectivity, even in remote and flex fully flexible environments. That like There's a big emphasis on that from teams like Atlassian and even like teams like Duos who bring people together internationally like at different intervals. Like, what are you yeah, seeing on that side? Absolutely. I think the, look, the best companies in the world approaching hybrid or fully remote, and that can be from the largest companies that are traditional companies that have adopted this model to world-class fully remote organizations. You talk about Duist, GitLab, um, others, right, that have done a really good job. Uh, they are incredibly intentional about bringing people together for valuable time. Mm -hmm. I think that there is a misunderstanding often in fully remote that people think fully remote means never in person together. The best organizations in the world do not approach it that way. And the leading companies that have shifted from full-time and office toward hybrid have repurposed, in some cases, the entirety of that real estate spend into more intentional investment in co-location and collaboration and offsites. And mm -hmm. one of the things that a researcher that I respect a lot, who we interviewed on our Flex Perspective podcast, Raj Chowdhury at HBS, has done some really good work and found that really intentional co-location in offsites where you get the right people together for a day or two days has huge benefits for how people collaborate asynchronously for a lot of time afterward. And so you can really make up for some of the time that you don't spend together if you're not in the office five days a week together with thoughtful and intentional time together. I think mm. then and I had Darren Murph on the podcast recently, who's just incredibly thoughtful on this topic. And Darren basically said, look, we started to do treks where employees would have budget to go plan trips anywhere in the world and people could jump on board. And, and that was a really intentional piece of the way that they built culture and connectivity in a fully remote organization. And so maybe to put a fine point on it, I think the best organizations in the world do not think about hybrid work or fully remote work from a cost savings perspective. There may be some, but that is not the driver of why they do that. They think about it from a flexibility and the benefits to flexibility perspective, and they reinvest that capital from real estate into ways for people to connect purposely and intentionally. And that's really important. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it, I think that, yeah, that, that is a very good point. When people think about this, they think about it arbitrarily, they think about it as a cost savings measure to go fully remote or fully flexible. But in the, in fact, you're actually choosing to invest more strategically in your employees. And I think the thing that people underestimate right now is that, and you've touched on this a little bit, the, the fact that people have not necessarily made concrete plans uh, for hybrid working, but also that does you know lead into training as well. Gallup had that recent study where they were talking about how 80% of employees have not actually received like any sort of training on how to successfully hybrid work. And it, that's a kind of a shocking statistic in some ways. You know, it's like employees aren't receiving the training they need to be successful in a hybrid environment. So I think that investment is one of those things that people underestimate that they need to be doing in order to be successful especially at the manager level. That's one of the ones that I think is just the biggest gap. Look, being a manager is so, so much harder in a hybrid environment, right? Like mm -hmm. you've got, first of all, you've got in a lot of companies, you've got pressure from executives that want to make sure the manager is pushing to have people come in enough, right? Like Amazon, I think came out the other day and they're like, managers, you know, we want you to, to not only make sure that people are coming in, but you should feel empowered to fire people you know, that are not, you know, Philly. So that's one pressure coming from executives to managers. Then they get the stuff that's coming up from employees. Hey, I need this, or this doesn't work for me. Or I really want more flexibility. Can you advocate on, on our behalf? And so managers are stuck in the middle and it's thankless. It's really hard. On top of that, most managers don't get great training in the first place in a lot of organizations and are used to managing by walking around and seeing that you're at your desk and assuming that if you're at your desk, you're probably being productive and and obviously that's not how productivity works, but a lot of people have gotten used to managing that way. And now managers have to manage to outcomes and think about what are the metrics that actually matter for us to move and how do I help a team member work through that remotely and have the right performance conversations and talk about whether they're on track or off track. And so managing in a hybrid or distributed environment is substantially harder 
than it is in a full-time in-office environment. There are very few companies that are doing a really good job today at figuring this out. One of them, by the way, and I learned this from a conversation I had recently with Kara Alamano, who's the chief people officer at Lattice. Uh, Lattice is doing a great job at thinking through this and how do you mm-hmm. establish really thoughtful manager and cohort-based training on how to be good at hybrid and distributed management. But a lot of companies are not very intentional here yet, and they're going to have to be in order to get this right. Yeah, I think that intentionality is really important because in the hybrid and you know, flexible environments, you need to have a lot of great trust between your managers and your employees. And that Brian Elliott talks about this all the time, like the, the need the really the great need for trust in a hybrid environment, because, you know, you're so if you're so used to watching someone and being needing to see that they're doing work in order to know they're doing work, that trust should be built up. And I think that trust does that cohesion and trust does get built up very quickly for small teams or large teams when you bring them together and the cohort comes together and then goes apart, they build trust very quickly. But that trust has to be there in order to manage in a remote environment or a flexible environment. And yeah, I think you're right. Like a lot of companies really are not very good about running training programs. Usually you just get promoted into a managerial position because you were a good individual contributor and you're not necessarily like, oh, well now you're a manager. Now you just have to figure out how to be a great manager. It's oh, but I was just a really great individual contributor. Yeah. And look, I grew up and I started my career at Bain doing strategy consulting. Bain is phenomenally good at training managers. And yet I, the exact same thing happened to me. I was a good individual contributor. I became a manager and I'll tell you an embarrassing story, which was we did a performance review process. And I don't know if Bain still does it this way, but they had a very thoughtful process where basically your team members, we get asked questions and not only would you basically get scored effectively based on that, but you could see how you were scored relative to every other manager in the office and then every other manager globally, not mm. in a, not in a non, not in a public way. Like you couldn't see, oh, this was what Omar's score was, but you could see where are you relative to the manager average or where are you re- it's a global average. Mm. And I remember the first time I went through this and I went home that day and I called my mom and I was like, I think I'm the worst manager in the history of management. And I, was, I just had no idea what I was doing. And I was like doing it for the first time. And, you know, the feedback was tough and. You know, and look, it it takes time and training and focus to make people good at management. And it requires exponentially more of that to make them good at management in a more hybrid environment where you don't get the carrot of being able to see each other every day and build the relationship just because you sit next to each other or you grab lunch or you see each other at the kind of coffee machine. And so that's another reason why those offsites are so important is because They create that space to be intentional on relationship building if you're not together all the time. And if companies underinvest in that stuff too, then you make it really hard on managers to be good at what they need to be good at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah, I had a very similar experience in my early managerial days of being a people manager. And it was not a fun experience going through Netflix's transparent 360 process, which (laughs) is probably a story I'll save for another time. Sounds like we may have had similar experiences around that. Yeah, very similar experiences, but I learned from them and that was great. Yeah, I think that the idea that we need to have this training and the idea that we need to invest in it is really important. And I think that it's great that you all are, you know, giving data to the community in order to enable companies to understand the subject better. How do you, as a company, you know, as running Flex Index, you know, like people will take the tagline, oh, company, you know, this is a line of truth, right? They're like, okay, well, if you're fully flexible, you're going to be more successful, 100%, this is it. Like the very black and white, you know, segments of LinkedIn, the stratosphere of LinkedIn, right? Or Twitter or whatever platform, X, whatever platform you're on at the moment. How do you, as a company, kind of deal with that, right? Because there is like the very, this is good, this is bad mentality in the future of workspace. But as practitioners, we all know there's so much nuance in between. Totally. Well, look, I'll answer that in a couple of different ways. One, it's very important to understand the difference between correlation and causation. We Mm -hmm. did not come out with the analysis on the linkage between revenue and flexibility and say, the reason why companies are outperforming on revenue is purely because they've adopted a fully flexible model. Rather, I think it is reflective of probably a number of decisions related to the culture and how they operate that is allowing them to outperform. Examples being, they probably have an easier time hiring from a broader range of geographies because they offer more flexibility. The Mm -hmm. average job seeker is likely more interested in their company than another company on average because flexibility matters to job seekers. Employees are more likely to be engaged and retain when they have more flexibility and autonomy over their work than they do when they don't. 
And so those things together should impact performance. Um, but it is one of a host of decisions that relates to the trust and culture and environment that you create for a company. It is not pure causation in practice. Mm -hmm. And I think that nuance is important. And I can say that even though I do advocate for flexible work, and I think that's important. And one of the things that I struggle with about the discourse on flexibility broadly is it feels like sometimes the way that primaries operate in the US, where in some ways it really motivates people who are really passionate on the far ends of the spectrum and become almost zealot about how they think about <laughs> this stuff. And if you think about our flexibility discussions broadly, you have on one side, you know, some CEOs and board members and execs that are pounding the table and saying, Hey, look, when I grew up, you know, I climbed uphill in the snow, six miles to the office and we went five days a week. And that's what made me great and the company great. And you can't succeed without that, you know, for a bunch of reasons. And therefore everyone's got to be back in the office full time. And that's how it has to be. And on the other side, you've got some people who say, look, I don't understand why offices exist. I think there should be no more offices. Everybody should be fully remote. It doesn't matter. That's the answer. But I think those populations are actually pretty small on both mm -hmm. sides in reality. They're loud, but they're small. And the vast majority of people are in between where they're like, hey, look, I'd love to spend a little bit of time in the office and spend a little time out of the office. And it's good for me to balance. And there's certain activities that I get more energy out of doing with other people in person, whether they be social or professional development or collaboration. And there are certain things I would rather do at home or other responsibilities that make it easier for me to keep my job at home and would rather be somewhere in the middle. And I really advocate and push hard to make sure we bring the nuance that brings light to the middle versus focusing too much on the polls, because that's what most people I think want. And that's where I think most companies as a result are going to end up going over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love your comparison. We will not talk politics on here, but I, I love your comparison to like the primaries, right? Where it's, you have these very extreme ends, which the populations are, and I would love to, you know, find some data on this, like what the populations look like of the, like these very specific opinions versus what is in between. Right. And I think sometimes people feel that they have to be extreme over here in the future of workspace in order to not lose what has been gained within the course of the pandemic. So, you know, we have this three or four year period now as we've exited out of the pandemic officially and, you know, gone into this, you know, what we're going to go into in 2024, I'm going to be very interested to watch how your data uh, skews over time or how it changes over time um, based on what happens over the next three to four years. Because we've been in this interesting period of, uh, you know, in the financial markets, especially ups and downs and backs and forths. And it's been a very tumultuous period. So I'll be very interested to see how we normalize, if there is such a thing as normalization over the next five to 10 years within this industry, because I, I think you're right, it's going to land a lot more in the middle than people think on either side. I do like Nick Bloom's example of remote work being a Nike swoosh. Yes, it is going to slowly increase over time. What I would like to know is how long that swoosh is. Is it 100 years? Is it you know, one, 150? Is it 25? What is, how long is that timeline? Yeah, I'll give you my best guess. And look, you know, I'm not an economist and I couldn't give you a perfect answer, right? But I'll, I'll give you my best sense based on the data and the things that I look at. And, you know, and, and then we can, we'll do this podcast again in 2033 and we'll see like <laughs> how good I was at it, you know? But I think there's a few things that are going on that will drive kind of like the time horizon over which this moves. Number one, I think that we are already seeing you know, with each passing quarter and our flex index data, little bits of movement in the US, at least in terms of the relative split of companies. Beginning of the year, 49% of companies were full-time in office. A quarter ago, it was 38% or 39%. Now it's 38%. So it's moved 11 points year to date. It has slowed down in the speed at which it's moving. But I think you're going to see little bits of movement point here, point there, you know, quarter by quarter going into the coming years. The second thing that I think is going to happen and I think people, we talk about this in our report sometimes, so I think not everyone realizes is there is just a massive difference in the approach to flexibility based on when a company was founded hmm. and not just tech companies, but broadly when companies were founded, the two big kinks that we see are one, there's a huge difference pre 2000 versus post 2000. And then again, there's a big difference 2000 to 2009 versus 2010 and beyond. Why is that happen? There are a couple of things. If you think about the technology that's changed in the underlying way we think about work over that time period, the big shift from the nineties to two thousands coincided with the internet rapidly being adopted for work more broadly across organizations and people as a mm -hmm. result getting much more comfortable working in different locations or having access to work in different locations via the internet. The second is 
2010s is the era of the smartphone. People forget that like the iPhone only first came out, I think in 2008, right? So it's like rapid evolution of smartphones, of Slack, of Microsoft Teams, of video conference technology, right? Like the amount of evolution there from 2010 to 2020 is just massive. And so when we look at the data and look specifically at companies that were founded 2011 or beyond in the US, 93% of them offer work location flexibility versus mm. on an average basis across all companies, it's 62%. And so just if all of those companies keep their current policies, so nobody made any changes from here, imagine where we said, okay, You know, if you went from there and said, okay, that's where we're going to be with each passing year, the base would get more flexible anyway, because older companies would age out companies that were founded past 2000 or 2010 would be a bigger portion of the workforce. And so that will add points of movement year by year from there. That's the second piece. And then the third, and then I'll pause is the average lease in the U S is more than 10 years long, especially for large companies. And mm -hmm. while it feels like the pandemic was, you know, a hundred years ago, in reality, we're only three and a half years in since the pandemic. And so that means that 65% of the leases still haven't turned over that were signed prior to 2020. So mm -hmm. every year through the 2020s and even into the low 2030s, you're going to see leases expire as leases expire. That's going to allow companies to not only revisit how much space they need, but also their flexibility policy in line with that. And that will create further movement. So my guess is it's really over the next 10 years or so you see kind of like steady move against it. And if I had to bet, I think it probably ends up at 85% of us companies offer work location flex for their corporate employees, but it may be a point, two points, three points at a time, you know, over the next decade or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. I think that the people um, don't necessarily understand the length of real estate cycles, especially when you're taking these large portions of spaces. There's been a lot of headlines, you know, obviously in the past three years of companies paying exorbitant amounts of money to get out of leases. And they all they see is the headline of, oh, a company paid $90 million to get out of this long term lease, but they're saving themselves a couple hundred million dollars on the other side of this because they're paying to get out of it, but they're not paying the long term, you know, obviously operations costs, you know, facilities costs, all these things in, in order to keep that portfolio running. And that that this massive effect that has happened for the real estate industry has been very fascinating to watch. But I do think that they're the industry is one, I think it's in its own way, flexible and adaptable. You know, we've gone through, you know, boom and bust cycles in real estate all the time. I think that's one of those things that I've seen people starting to adapt to. And I do think we're seeing more actually innovative and different kinds of product offerings. And if anything, I think it's actually moved in some ways the industry along um, a path that they might not have gone down as quickly. I think we're seeing like more workplace experience teams. We're seeing a larger focus on actual experience of spaces. We're seeing more hospitality driven spaces. And I think we're seeing people be more considerate about how they design those spaces and how they enable them um, as well. But on the upside of this as well, I think is that we're actually seeing more, despite the, you know, the downfall of WeWork and in some ways, like the great, the company still exists. There's a lot of great people who still work there, but you know, despite some of their trials and tribulations, the coworking sector and the membership space sector is doing very well. And there's a lot of really amazing membership and coworking spaces that are being built you know, being built out today, like Shack 15 in San Francisco is a great example of this. Noya House in Los Angeles, Soho House continues to expand all over the world, essentially. Um, and I think that is actually one of the, the interesting outcomes of this whole thing is that, yes, we will have people reducing, you know, increasing flexibility, potentially reducing real estate size total, but increasing employee experience. And so that seems like a net good, but there's a lot of adaptation on the physical infrastructure side that's going to have to happen. And that will likely, I think, be very painful for, especially for as cities adapt to these changes. That, I think it's absolutely right. And I think it's not going to be, the, the impact is not going to be evenly felt across properties. Like class B, class C properties are going to get hit way, way harder than mm -hmm. newer spaces that are more of a destination. I think the... I think that companies breaking their leases early and paying large amounts of money to do it is a somewhat misunderstood phenomenon, in my personal mm. opinion. Yes, there is a reason to do it financially in terms of I put some money out now, but it's actually less in a present value perspective than all of the payments that have to make over the years. But I think a big part of it, too, is employee experience. You know, if you think about Meta, for example, which I think has at least several offices, I think, in the London area, getting out of one of those offices and as a result, concentrating people into 
fewer offices where there's more energy as a result, it feels less empty, it's a better experience for employees that go in, is better culturally now, not only better financially now. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important point. One of the reasons why I think some companies are pushing so hard on return to office is because for the employees that do want to be in, if there are only a, a few people in the office in this cavernous space, that's a pretty crappy experience for the people that do go in. And so they're trying to push so that people who do want to be together actually feel like it's a good opportunity to do so. Mm -hmm. But lease expiration will allow for revisiting that and changing the amount of space you have, which will also cause a rethink in and how people approach flexibility in the first place. Yeah, and I, th I think that benefit of you know reducing down space in order to bring more people into the space to actually create that you know, vibe for lack of a better word, right? Like that good feeling when you get when the space is just the right amount of occupied because a very empty space can feel in some ways very desolate and like you're not gonna wanna come in. And I think that coordination of where and when employees work is one of those things that has to happen in this time period. And I think companies are underestimating the work it takes to actually coordinate 15 people's schedules and take into under, take into account their preferences, the nuances of their family dynamics. If somebody takes PTO, someone's kid gets sick, someone gets a cold, someone's car breaks down, those things have to be accounted for. And it, it, it's great to set up team agreements and team plans, but I think you need to have that understanding in order to bring people together and do what you were just describing, which is bringing them into this space to create a better outcome and create better dynamics internally. I think that's not a bad thing. I think it's actually a very positive thing. I'd be remiss if I didn't plug Scoop here, by the way, as a that being a uh, one of these central things that we focus on from a software people is enabling better coordination around who's going to be in the office and when, so that when you do go, it feels like a good experience. So I agree. I think it's an incredibly important part of hybrid um, and distributed work broadly is making sure that when people do go to the office, it feels like it's worth the commute. And that's largely driven out of the ability to get together with the right people, which requires visibility and planning and coordination in the way that you described. Yeah. And I, I would love to know your thoughts on this. As you're describing this idea of, you know, people adjusting real estate over time, how do you see, you know, Flex Index as a data source kind of enabling, you know, executives to make choices, one, and enable them to make, you know, like positive choices for their companies, but also positive choices for their employees. And then two, how do you see that data being used by even people in like government or, you know, planning divisions? Do you see that do you see them use like, you know, reaching or are they reaching out to get that data to understand it more to see where it's like where that trend is heading? Or are you having those discussions as well? Yeah, we've had a bunch of folks reach out a lot of finance folks, investors in commercial real estate trying to figure <laughs> out what's happening in different markets probably doesn't surprise you to hear that. I we are really interested in starting to be able to give companies better benchmarks around what their peer set or other companies that they care about are doing. And you know, today you can go to Flex Index and you can look for a company and search one by one to figure out a company's policy broadly. But how do I enable a company to really easily benchmark what their peers are doing, what companies of their size or in their geography or industry are doing? It's something that's pretty top of mind for us. We're going to spend some time on, I think, you know, over the rest of this year and going into early next year. And then driving that into more granular data around things like what are your real estate holdings relative to the number of people you have? And how do you think about that relative to what others are doing? Those are areas that I think we know there's a lot of interest from real estate and kind of finance audiences around that. And so we're going to do some exploration there to see if we can't make this more practically useful at the individual company level in terms of decision making and, and understanding where you're at in that regard. That's great. And I think that's it's massively helpful to have another data source that is like in some ways independent, right? Like you're yes, of course I know you all have investors, you are a startup, but at the same time, you are in some ways like you know more independent than somebody who's just, you know, necessarily reliant on like real estate investment, et cetera. And I think that's beneficial for all of us to have more data sources. I hope there's more, you know, flex indexes that pop up, not necessarily doing the same thing, but I hope there's more resources and data sources that we can rely on. I think you're right, having three points of data is great. If we had 10 points of data, that'd be amazing. And you know, what might those data points be? I, I, by the way, if anyone has questions in the chat, please feel free to throw them in. Otherwise, Rob and I will suck up this entire hour with you know banter about the, the state of the industry. I, I do have one question for you on the Flex Index data. Are you seeing, and if you haven't dove into this, that's fine, but are you seeing any difference in the way that companies create flexible policies or the, the level of flexible policies based on the demographics of the executives? So for example, the age demographics or the gender demographics of those people leading the companies. So, you know, startups typically have founders who are much younger. 
in age or like them and, and they skew typically in a different direction than companies that are enterprise level because they tend to bring in seasoned, you know, CEO, executive leaders from other enterprise level organizations. What do you see any nuance there or do you see any like correlation there? You know, anecdotally, it's a phenomenal question. I, it is a topic I'm very interested in. And I've been, I think Nick and I have actually, Nick Loom and I have probably talked about this a bunch, which is like, what is the best way to pull gender or age or other types of uh, data like that for a wide range of companies, their CEO or their board members and see if there's a relationship with policy? There very well may be. We just haven't been able to, it's, it's hard data to come by. I have to do some work mm -hmm. to kind of figure it out, but I'm pretty interested in it. And if I think about flipping that, you know, and, and what we're seeing in labor trends broadly in the US, women aged 25 to 54 are participating in the US workforce at all time highs, according mm -hmm. to ALS data. Uh, people with disabilities are participating in the US workforce at all time highs. Flexible work hybrid and distributed work are creating opportunities for people to stay in the work fit and we're in the workforce and participate in ways that were not possible when everybody was required to be in the office full time. Mm -hmm. I can't overstate how important that is. I think it's just extremely important, not only in the U S but in countries broadly, there was a phenomenal piece of analysis that I saw go out the other day around the potential implication for women in India of being able to work flexibly and hmm. how much more interest there was in participating in the workforce if they were able to do that from home. And so as a result, the reason why I bring it up is I do guess that based on some of that data, you would probably find some variation in flexible work adoption based on the profile of executives at the company, but I haven't run the analysis on it yet, but it's something I would love to do. I hope we can get there in 2024. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I would love to see that. <laughs> I'm self, very selfishly, but I think you are right. You know, the flexibility, providing the opportunity for people who are normally, you know, sheltered out of the workforce in some ways, whether because they are older, whether because they have some sort of a level of disability. I think people underestimate the amount of people in the U.S. who actually have a, an invisible disability whether it's things like photosensitivity or, you know, like even just like excessive amounts of back pain, et cetera, and the longer people are staying in the workforce, and this is the first time we have all these generations in the multi-generational workforce of this expanse in history, I think that those become so, so important, not just for having more women in the workforce and keeping more women in the workforce, but also pe keeping people with disabilities in the workforce, because there's a lot of things in you know, physical real estate, um, that we cannot correct, right? There's cities that have, you know, buildings that are, you know, really they have historic designations. So you can't actually build ramps in them. You, it's very hard to actually, or very expensive to actually, you know, or it's sometimes impossible from coding to actually uh, adjust or improve those spaces. And companies would usually be very picky choosy about like where they would actually go and put those spaces because of those reasons. But it wasn't always possible for companies to choose the perfect space for accessibility if they're a young startup and they don't have a ton of money. So I think it's really important to be able to understand that like levels of accommodation are important, but also this opens a whole new door to people who did not have a door before at all. So I think that's, it's really important. I think that's one of those things that people don't necessarily realize is that this having this broad spectrum of offerings of different types of companies opens a door to so many more people to stay in the workforce for a longer period of time. Totally. And, and, and look, that's why we believe so strongly in visibility. Like I want job seekers to be able to find companies that reflect what they need. Yeah. It's better for companies and it's better for job seekers. It's more efficient. If companies can say, Hey, look, this is what we want. Employees can say, or a job seeker can say, this is what we need can match that the right way. This is a really important thing. It is a really important thing for people. It is a really important thing for different groups, people. And there's no reason why there shouldn't be visibility on this topic. Day by day, week by week, we're creating more of that visibility, which I'm very proud of. And I think we're just going to keep pushing in that direction to better enable that on a go forward basis. And I guess one, one more question about the Flex Index for you, Rob. How do you prevent the glass door effect. And I say the glass door effect because I have been at companies previously who have, as part of their onboarding process said, Hey, go leave some great reviews for us on, how do you ensure that, you know, as you'll allow companies to log in and start, you know, uh, say, Hey, we're flexible for this, we're flexible for that. How do you ensure the integrity of that information? And how do you one allow for self-service, but also at the same time, enable that, that kind of care to make sure that these are when you're servicing, you know, employees as a, or the labor force as a whole ensuring that integrity continues on like long-term basis. 
Yeah, totally. You know, it's interesting. Like, I think it's a little bit of a different animal than Glassdoor, right? And I think Glassdoor mm -hmm. is a great property, but like Glassdoor, there's a vested interest in companies in trying to portray themselves well on Glassdoor, right? Glassdoor yeah. is fundamentally a place to go find how your employees rate your employer, et cetera, right? Flexibility is not for a given company inherently good or bad. It's a choice, right? Some companies will believe in full-time in office and will build amazing cultures around being full-time in office with people who are really interested in full-time in office. Some companies will do the exact same thing with fully remote and other companies will do it with all manner in between. It benefits nobody to incorrectly communicate what you offer from a flexibility perspective, because as soon as an applicant gets into your interview process, they're going to find out it's not actually the case, right? And then they yeah. just reach out to Flex Index and they go update and say, hey, look, that's actually not the case. And we reach back out to the company and figure it out. Luckily, we haven't had any of those issues so far. I just don't think there's a lot of good motivation for companies to kind of like fabricate like their flexibility policy mm -hmm. publicly around this. And especially as we move more into benchmarking, getting data, companies will want to be able to get accurate data on what others are doing relative to themselves. And that's also going to be a motivation, I think, for, for inputting the right stuff so you can understand where you're at relative to your peer set. But we take it really seriously. Every time somebody updates Flex Index, we triangulate it with anything we can find publicly. We reach out to executives at the company to make sure we've got it right. We take a pretty high bar to that. We won't always be perfect, you know, and we continue to improve on it, but we we're trying to create all the right motivations and the right processes to make sure that we have, you know, as accurate information as we possibly can. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. We're at the hour, so we're going to make sure we end this on time. Rob, I really appreciate you taking the time today. I really appreciate the deep discussion and the deep, you know, level of insight. I know you're someone who studies this stuff all the time that you have for this. So I really appreciate uh, obviously you joining us. We're going to put this out on, you know, a replay for everybody so everyone can kind of go and see it. Uh, I want to thank everyone for taking their time this morning with us and that anyone who watches this after, thank you again. That's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, great set of questions. I feel like we covered a lot of ground, so I'm excited to see the replay too. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody. All right. Thanks. Have a great day.